Thank you all so much for coming out this morning. We're so excited to see such a great crowd in person because we've done this online several times, uh, but having you in person is just amazing. So um, I'm Molly Moore. Uh, I'm president of Southern Maryland Audubon Society. I'm also a Charles County Master Gardener, and I am a Maryland Master Naturalist uh, based at the Nanjimoy Creek Environmental Education Center. And Marlene, over to you. Hi, um, I'm Marlene Smith. I've been a Charles County Master Gardener since 2015, currently the treasurer of the Master Gardeners. I'm also a Baywise Master Gardener, a Maryland tree steward, and a member of the Southern Maryland Audubon Society. I'm just so happy to see everyone here today. Winter sowing is the best thing ever invented for native plants. And so what is winter sowing? It is an incredibly easy way to grow seedlings. So what's better? In the middle of winter, you know, you put some planting medium in a milk jug that has a hole in the top and holes in the bottom for ventilation and drainage, and you put the seeds out, and it, the jug's out with the seeds, and you wait for them to sprout in the spring. So winter sowing was introduced by a woman named Trudy Davidoff in 2000, and it's since been um, uh, approved by the USDA. There's a fabulous, she has a winter sowing Facebook page. Why winter sow? It's cheap, especially compared to buying seeds and seed and plants. The whole process is based on recycled containers like milk jugs and plastic fast food boxes. If it allows for condensation, you can use it. Winter sowing is easy. No special skills are necessary. And kids especially love winter sowing and watching their seeds sprout and grow. It's also fun. It lets you get your hands dirty during the dead of winter when the rest of your garden is sleeping and the days are short and dreary. What I especially love is there are no hard and fast rules. So let's talk about some of the advantages of, uh, of winter sowing. It protects your seeds. Um, it protects them from weeds growing in your pots. It protects them, sad to say, as president of Audubon, it protects them from the birds eating them before they can sprout. Uh, and the other critters that might come along, also heavy rains washing them away. And it also produces incredibly strong, healthy plants. We're gonna show you what's happening. You see these tiny little seedlings coming up in your jugs. What's happening down below is these incredibly healthy root systems are growing. Um, and because they're so protected, they can just put their energy in growing those roots and that's what's gonna make the healthiest native plant. One of the best things is it eliminates hard, hardening off. I'm sure a lot of you have gone through the whole process. You plant your seeds in your house, you have grow, grow lights, and then spring comes along, and you're running around putting those pots outside, and you're bringing them in again when it freezes. You don't worry about that. You put your jugs out, and the whole idea is the plants like the snow, they like the rain, you know, they like all the elements of winter uh, that are gonna help them germinate. You don't have to water because condensation builds up in the jugs and naturally waters them. And then it provides for cold, moist stratification. And for those of you who've not germinated native plants before, this is something that native plants need basically to germinate. And it's one of the most beneficial reasons for winter sowing natives. They have this naturally hard coating that helps prevent the seeds from being tricked into coming out of dormancy too early because of unseasonable warm spells in winter. So you should check your seed pack for how long species require this cold moist stratification. Um, you'll see here we've just put a couple of examples up. Um, some are for 60 days like the orange coneflower. Uh, a good number are you know short for 30 days like butterfly weed and joe pie and, and common milkweed. But always check your package and it will tell you how long it needs the cold stratification. Now, if you're winter sowing, you don't really need to worry about that a whole lot. You can plant your jugs in January or early February and don't worry about counting the days. Nature's gonna do that for you. So let's talk for just a minute about natives and about what is a native and how it's classified as a native. So native plants are part of the balance of nature. They have co-evolved with our native birds and insects and pollinators and 
animals and other wildlife over hundreds of thousands of years. So it's part of the same ecosystem. And in the US, even though there's some plants that have been here for hundreds of years, say when the Europeans settled and invaded this part of the world, um, those are not natives. So the only plants found in this country before that European invasion are considered actual <coughs> real and true native plants. <coughs> so there are a multitude of reasons to grow native plants. Number one, they are better suited to our climate. You know, we all have tried to plant these pretty tropical plants in our yards at some point and they die. Well, they didn't grow up here, so they can't stand the cold. Um, even with the changing climate, many of our native plants are changing with that climate and are better adapted to change than just sort of outside ornamental plants that you would plant, it might plant in your yard. They require less water over their lifetime. Now, when you first plant the seedlings, like the seedlings that you're gonna grow in your jugs, um, you do need the first year to make sure they get adequate water, especially ones that you've planted out in the spring because everybody knows how much drought we can get in our summers here. So you can't just plant them and forget them in the yard the first year. You wanna really help those babies grow and, and be healthy. Uh, they don't require fertilizer or pesticides. Um, in fact, a lot of native plants, if you fertilize them, they're gonna get tall and droopy and droop over and they're gonna look really scraggly. They don't need all those extra nutrients of fertilizers that you know you would buy at the, at the hardware store or the nursery or whatever. Now, the one thing that they can benefit from when you first plant those little seedlings, you can put a very diluted uh, bit a fertilizer in the hole with them just to help them jump start um, and get a good start on life. But after that, basically all they need in the fall, you can kind of mulch them with some leaves or some pine straw or a little bit of mulch, but they're not like all these fussy little, you know, non-native ornamentals that require you to constantly be fertilizing them. And they don't need pesticides. So that doesn't mean insects are not going to eat your native plants. But the truth is, you want the insects to eat your native plants. You want the, the monarch caterpillars on your milkweed. And all native plants are host to some kind of native butterflies or moths or other insects. And so it's okay if they're over there nibbling on your leaves. That's part of the whole healthy ecosystem you're creating in your yard. Um, but for the most part, a lot of natives are not gonna be bothered by these sort of non-native insects that are coming along um, that, you know, if you're, we don't recommend putting pesticides on anything, but especially the native plants are just not gonna need them. The other thing is they t tolerate a huge variety of soil and light conditions. So um, I don't know about you guys, but my yard has a lot of clay and especially you know, developers come along in these new developments and they scrape all the good topsoil off and take it somewhere else and sell it. And you're left with this like hard packed clay. And you think, oh, nothing's gonna grow in that. Well, lots of natives really like that kind of clay soil, like the, uh, the, our state flower, the black eyed Susan, the rudbeckia, loves it. Joe pie weeds love it. Um, and then some people have problems with boggy areas in their yards. And there's native plants that just love to have, as it's called, wet feet. They can stand being in those boggy areas. And in fact, if you're having runoff problems, they'll absorb some of that moisture. They also add year round interest and beauty to your yard. So, you know, you go out and you plant like begonias or in place impatience or something like that, and you get this big burst of color, and then they all die. Native plants are four season plants. Um, they come up, and also, if you plant a good variety, they're blooming throughout the season. They provide the food and shelter for the native. But you know what? If you have a lot of natives in your yard, you're going to notice the birds going to your feeders less because they're going to go hit those native plants and seeds first. So I have a question. How many insects does it take this Carolina chickadee to raise one family? Does anybody have a guess? We have a 500. 
Anybody have another guess? What's that? 2,000? Okay, that's a good guess. 20,000? 10,000? 10,000 is the closest. Um, 9,000 insects to raise one family. So the research on this and how we know this was this amazing guy na named Dr. Uh, Douglas Tallamy, and he is a professor at the University of Delaware, and he's become sort of like an icon in the native plant world. So one of the best parts of winter sowing is that you can grow so many more varieties of plants than you can find at a local nursery or a big box store. Marlene's going to take us through the actual steps of winter sowing now. Marlene, over to you. Thanks, Molly. Now we're going to go through them step by step as to how we do the process. Okay, so winter covers basically a three-month period from December 21st to March 20th. And according to Trudy, who developed this method, you know, we start on winter solstice. All native plants, but especially those that require cold moist stratification, can be started any time during the winter. The things that require the longest cold moist stratification you should start first. There is no real schedule, but if you are looking at doing something that requires 90 or 120 days of stratification, you want to make sure to get that in early enough so that it gets the benefit of that cold weather. But those that need the lesser, like 30 days, 10 days, some of them don't need any stratification, you can do later in the, sum, in the winter. And actually, winter sowing can go into the spring and the summer for other plants. Um, it's just that during this three-month period, it's referred to as winter sowing. You can use it for basically any type of native plant, not just perennials and annuals like we have here today. You can do grasses, vines, trees, shrubs, and I have had experience with all of them and you know I've had a good success rate. And like Molly said, the seeds are basically going to take their cues from Mother Nature based on the temperature and the length of day as to when to sprout. So you can't really winter sow anything too early in the winter season. So now we know what it is and when we can do it, we probably need to talk about what are some of the tools that we need for winter sowing. Well, naturally you need a container. Trudy started with recycled milk jugs, recycled takeout containers, anything that can hold about three to four inches of soil for native plants and allow headroom for the sprouts is good. But we're gonna concentrate on the milk jugs today because that's just the easiest to prepare for first time winter sowers. You need a good potting mix. You can use anything that's labeled potting mix. Molly and I both use a seed starting mix. That's fine too. You just want to stay away from anything that's marked garden soil and you don't want to use any of your native soil in your gardens. That's too dense for drainage. So a good potting mix or a seed starting mix is typically what you're going to use. If you get a dry mix, which many of them are, you're going to need a bucket to mix the soil with water. You're going to need the water, jug of water. You're going to need a spade or some sort of tool to mix your soil and water together until you get a good consistency, and we'll talk about that more later. You're going to need scissors or some other sharp tool like an X-Acto knife to cut your jug, gloves, um, either garden gloves or latex gloves. You're going to need tape for sealing your containers, and we'll talk about that a little more later. Some sort of markers. Trudy's go-to method is marking with like a Sharpie duct tape and putting it on the bottom of the jug so it's not exposed to the UV light. But we have found that things like china markers and particular garden markers that you can purchase will withstand the winter season in the sun. We also recommend and we both put plant markers inside our jugs so that if something happens that your writing wears off on the outside or you cut the top off in the spring and throw the jug aside, you still have some sort of marker on your plant. And you need seeds, of course. And optional, some of us put newspaper or fabric barrier or coffee filters in the bottom of our jug to keep the soil in and the slugs out. It's not necessary, it's just something we found helpful. And I do want to make mention before I go any further, 
Anything you see today that's like a brand name on an item, we are not endorsing that product per se. It's just here for demonstration purposes, but it's hard to do some of the demonstration and get everything generic without a manufacturer's name on it. So as Master Gardeners, we don't promote particular products. You know, we're here to promote the method today and to promote the native seeds. So the first step preparing your container, whether it be a milk jug or some other container, is to make your cuts. The first cut should probably be your drainage holes in the bottom so that you don't forget that. And then for a milk jug, once you've cut the four to six holes, however many you prefer in the bottom, you want to make your cut around the jug. You want to make sure you leave maybe an inch or two under the handle to serve as a hinge so that it will be easy to put these back together and close them up. And when I do my preparation of jugs, I typically prepare all my jugs you know, have them setting aside before I move on to the next steps. So a word about containers, you don't have to use milk jugs. There are plenty of different options. You can use deli takeout containers, tall plastic drink cups or treat or jars, um, even plastic. Some people do it in plastic baggies. Just remember if it can hold three to four inches of potting soil and be covered with a lid that it can vent air and allow the snow and the water in, you'll be fine. Now, depending on the type of container you use, a milk jug is pretty easy, holes in the bottom, hole in the top takes care of this um, ventilation and letting the water in. You don't need any additional holes on top. But if you use something other than a milk jug or a bottle, you may need to do other prep steps. So something like this butter tub, you can use but you need to make sure you do a modification to let light in. So the tub itself is opaque, it doesn't let light in, but if you cut like a window in the top, like saran wrap or a film on it, you can then put the lid back on and punch holes in the wrap so that it gets the moisture in and the air out. Bleach jug. So a bleach jug, that's opaque also, it doesn't let light in, but you could use a bleach jug. You could cut a window like in the front of the jug, if I could see that, you could like cut a window here and then like tape a clear wrap over it, leave the cap off, and you could use even a bleach jug. The whole idea is recycling and to use as many different types of containers as you can. So if it's transparent, like the treat jug, the popcorn jug, that is fine without any modification except to the top and the drainage holes. The milk jugs are considered translucent. We talked about that, but it's the transparent ones excuse me, the opaque ones that don't let light through, that you need to make sure you take those additional steps. And if I fail to say it, once you've made your cuts in the milk jug, throw the cap away. Any kind of container that you're using that had a cap on it, throw it away. You're not going to use it. You're going to let the air escape through that hole and let the water and the snow in. Okay, next we'll talk about labels. Labeling is probably one of the most important things because you want to make sure in the spring when it comes time to put your plants out that you know what you have. So again, duct tape on the bottom with your plant ID is what Trudy's go-to method is. Many of us use like a china marker or a garden marker that you can put on the outside of the jug that will withstand that UV light. Plant tags inside, used Venetian blinds, popsicle sticks, those you can write on pencil. The pencil on those inside the jug will hold up over time. And really, there are no hard and fast rules, and we'll probably, you know, we're telling you a lot of different options you can use. That's because that's one of the beautiful parts about winter sowing. You don't have to do it the same way someone else does, as long as you do that basic process. Your potting mix preparation is going to kind of depend on what type you get. Both Molly and I use a dry mix, and that's what we brought today. So you're going to put your soil in a large bucket, add water until it's wet but not soggy. And what you'll see is if you squeeze it in the palm of your hand, if the water drips from it, it's a little bit too wet and you could add more of the mix. If it doesn't hold together when you hold it in the palm of your hand, it probably needs a little more water. And you'll actually see that while you're working on your jugs today. Again, warm water if you're working outside hydrates the soil much better than cold water. Now you want to add your potting mix. If you're going to use a barrier to keep your soil in and the slugs out, you want to add that. Again, it's not necessary. It's just something that some of us have started to practice. You want to then add your soil. And for natives, you want at least three to four inches of mix in the container. 
you want to tap the container lightly either with your hand or tap it on the the counter or the table to make sure the um, soil settles a bit and one of the most frequently questions that people get asked when they're teaching winter sowing is what type of soil do I use again there are no hard and fast rules and we don't promote necessarily one brand or one thing over another we're just telling you what we've done from experience you can use a potting mix that contains a fertilizer but you want to make sure it's a mild fertilizer like in a seed starting mix if you use something with too strong a fertilizer you might burn the um, the new roots you definitely want to avoid potting mixes that say they're weed free because if a potting mix is weed free it's designed to prevent the sprouting of weed seeds, which means it may also prevent the sprouting of your native seeds. So steer clear of those that say weed free. Also in Southern Maryland, um, because our winters are really pretty damp compared to some of the dry areas where they winter sow, you probably don't want to use something that has moisture retention crystals. So if you think your seeds need to be wet and it's even better to use something with moisture retention crystals, you may find that in our area that's not a benefit and I think Molly has an example of that later what might happen when your um, jugs get too um, wet all right now that you have your soil in your containers it's time to plant your seeds recommendation is typically to put one type of seed in each jug if you put more than one type you probably want to make sure you choose seeds that germinate around the same time because if you put something in that's an early germinator versus something that's a late season germinator you may have some trouble coordinating getting those seedlings out in the growing season if you haven't done so already after you've put your soil in before you plant your seeds please make sure you mark your containers we can't stress that enough if you're using a really tiny seed you might want to use some sort of sand to mix your seed with the sand and what that does is just helps evenly distribute it one thing that's important to stress is if you're using a seed packet that has planting directions, those directions are intended for indoor sowing or outdoor direct sowing. The only information you need off a seed packet is the planting depth, because you want to make sure you plant your seeds to the proper depth, the sun requirements for germination. Some seeds will tell you they need light to germinate, so you want to make sure those seeds are just lightly put on top of the soil and pressed to the soil. And you also want to pay attention to the days for cold stratification. But if it tells you the sunshade requirements on your seed packet, that is for your sprouted mature plants. That's not for your seeds. So don't think if your seed packet says that it requires shade to grow that you, your jugs have to be in the shade. Your jugs can pretty much go outside anywhere. Those sunshade requirements are for the developing plants, not the seeds. So depending on how big your seeds are may determine how you space them in your containers. If it's a large enough seed that when the plants sprout and you want to transplant them individually, you probably want to plant them separated within your containers. If it's something that is a very small seed that's hard to get in individually, you'll want to just kind of sprinkle those and that's kind of considered hunk of seeds and then when you go to transplant those in the spring once they sprout you can actually just cut those apart kind of like a brownie and plant little like one to two inch hunks however you know whatever size you want with multiple seeds and mother nature will take care of weeding out the ones that are less strong and your strongest ones should develop and now that you've um, gotten to the point that your seeds are in oh one thing I did forget to say was some seeds require the light to germinate so you don't want to cover those once you put them on the surface if it does doesn't require light to germinate you can just sprinkle them on but then cover with a light um, layer of your soil and then once you've done that you want to make sure you sprinkle them in so sealing the containers what type of tape do we use any type of tape anything is probably good you can use duct tape you can use painters tape you can use electrical tape you can use packing tape you can use freezer tape, anything you have on hand, but you may find as you go through that some are easier to use than others. I used packing tape my first year and it was a bear to get off after the end of the winter season. So I've kind of converted to painter's tape, but whatever works for you, whatever you have on hand, anything's fine as long as you can keep your jug sealed. 
And typically you want to put your milk jug back together and put your tape entirely around the jug. You want a pretty much airtight seal when you bring your jug back together. If it's not airtight, it's not the end of the world. It's just that your jugs may dry out sooner if they're not airtight and little critters can get in the jugs. So you do want to maybe try to get them taped as well as you can. And that's it for sealing and I'm for that prep and I'm going to turn it over to Molly for care of the jugs and further information. Thanks Marlene. Mm -hmm. So you've planted and closed up your containers and you want to again we can't stress this enough make sure you've taken that cap off repurpose it for something else or put it in the recycle bin. The whole idea is to let the rain and the snow into the containers and we get this question all the time when it, where a hard freeze is coming up. Oh my God, do I need to bring my jugs in the house? And no, 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 you never want to do that. That will completely disrupt their germination process. They're really happy out there in your cold garden. So just leave them there. And you want to put the containers in a protected area, safe from winds and pets and wild animals and young kids and clumsy adults because you don't want them to get, all, get knocked over. And it's best to put them in an area that is part shade and part sun so they aren't subject to the extremes. So now comes the hardest part of winter sowing. It's like waiting, waiting, <laughs> waiting for the termination. Some will take longer than others. Some actually, you know, if, if you start doing this over a period of years, you'll see some germinate at different times. But it depends on the weather we're having in winter. Mother Nature tells them when to germinate. There's just no way that you can rush it. Although you should peek during the winter to see kind of uh, what's going on inside your jugs. And that's kind of the fun part when you start seeing them. So you should monitor your seedlings during the winter. It's, it's, it's very little maintenance, but it's not just throw out there and forget. And here's why you want to peek inside and monitor them. You want to make sure that your, your soilless mixture is wet, but not waterlogged. So if there's condensation on the inside of your jug, you're probably in good shape. If there's no condensation and you look down there and it looks like your soil is drying out, you will need, need to water them. The past few winters here, that has not been a problem, but we have had some winters where there's just weeks with no rain, no snow, and in that case, you can either water them from the top, use a, a, a little spray squirter and spritz in there, or you can set them in a little tub or tray of water and let them water from uh, the bottom. The problem you can tell when you've watered too much or they've gotten too much water is you see the one with the green algae here. This happened to one of mine. Just generally doesn't happen in the dead of winter. It's usually in that period in the spring when we get lots of rain, you have days that heat up. So if this happens, you know, don't despair. Just uh, take the tape off of your jugs and open them up for a couple of days. And generally that will, that will dry them out a bit. So spring's approaching, you've been peeking inside your jugs and your seeds have germinated. So now what do you do with them? So you're gonna see all these little seeds like this one here and you're gonna think, oh wow, they're great. They're getting ready to transplant. But these actually are not real leaves. They're cotyledons. They're actually a part of the seed that's giving nutrition to the plant, to the embryo of the plant. So you want to leave them undisturbed until you see either two sets of true leaves or maybe the easiest way to do it is just wait till they're a couple of inches high. And the key thing to remember is to trust the process. Mother Nature knows when to awaken the different seeds and the varieties after they've been exposed to the winter elements and then spring. Mother Nature will just tell them when to sprout. If your plants are growing really quickly in the jug in the springtime, when we're kind of in that transition period, you know, you may even some sort of see shooting out the top, hot scorching spring days, you can open them up to make sure that they don't cook inside. So the weather's warmed up, 
your plants are two or three or four inches tall, so it's time to transplant the seedlings. So as in every kind of gardening, there's plenty of subjectivity on when it's time to transplant. But natives are much more forgiving than like tender annuals or veggies or something like that. They can usually take sudden cold snaps in stride, which your tender annuals and your hot weather veggies can't. But we still don't recommend transplanting them until they're the right size and until the, the soil has warmed up enough for you to work it. Because even though they are hardy, those little um, roots that are so important to them growing can get shot, you know, if you're, if you're trying to dig in partially frozen uh, soil or something, and that also ruins your soil, so you don't want to do that. So when it's time to transplant, open the containers to let them acclimate to the air for two or three days if you haven't already opened them. You may, they may have started growing enough that you've opened them. So the beauty of winter sowing is in the really vigorous root system that you can't always see. So I pulled these out of their jug and when I was pulling them apart, it's just extraordinary, the roots. So I took one of the roots and stretched it out. You can see the plants are about two inches high. But look what's going on down there in that planting medium. The, the roots are like three or four times the length of the seedling itself. There was just over six inches of root under the surface. And that is the sign of a really healthy plant. At this stage of a plant's life, the roots are way more important than the leaves. So, how do you get them out of the jugs? So sometimes you can just flip over the container and they'll pop right out. And other times they're a little stubborn, like you can see here. They really don't want to leave. <laughs> But there they go. See, you can see all the roots there. And those are some healthy little baby plants. So the roots are long and they're healthy, but you still need to be careful taking them out of the containers when you're going to take them apart so that you don't rip them. So you want to be very gentle with them and kind of treat them like the tender babies they are. So if you're using the hunk of seeds methods that Marlene talked about a little earlier, you can use a sharp knife to cut them through, as she said, kind of uh, brownie style. The idea behind hunk of seeds is that Mother Nature will allow the strongest and the healthiest plants to survive. I personally have had mixed results with the hunk of seed method. Uh, cardinal flowers, for instance, aren't really wild about it. They kind of much rather for you to give them a little more space. And a lot of herbs really don't like, like I tried planting a hunk of chamomile out and like the whole hunk died. This is something that you can experiment with and you may have great luck doing different methods. That's the beauty in the final winter sowing. So again, like I mentioned earlier, whichever method you use those first few weeks, just make sure that you're watering them and you're keeping an eye out for uh, critters eating them because a lot of wildlife love those really delicious tender little leaves and so if you're having those problems you can put some kind of like hardware cloth or chicken wire the one thing we recommend you do not ever ever put over them is this stuff they sell in the stores called bird netting because snakes will get caught in them and choke to death so what if your eyes were bigger than your available planting space <laughs> and all your seeds have sprouted and they're just growing out of their containers. Well, this is the most fun. You can transplant them into like these two to four inch pots where their roots can keep expanding until your own beds are ready for transplanting. Or you can give them away to friends and neighbors. And in fact, this is a great way to introduce your neighbors to native plants. One of the biggest complaints we hear of people who are going native in their yard is that their neighbors complain, oh, your yard looks so scraggly. When are you going to cut those weeds down? And so if you give them some of your weeds and they discover they're not really weeds, but they're beautiful flowers and they end up having more birds and butterflies in their yard. And in fact, one thing just to note, we're really lucky in Maryland. The legislature passed a law two years ago 
that said homeowners associations cannot stop you from turning your yard into a native plant garden as opposed to just having a manicured lawn out there. So some natives, like you'll see we have some cardinal flower seeds over here. They actually benefit in, in, in being planted in pots in the spring when you take them out of the jugs because they're probably not gonna bloom the first year anyway because they're biennials. Uh, and it just lets them develop better roots and better and, and more stem and leaf and you plant them in the fall, which is a, a great time to plant sort of delicate plants like that because they can't really stand our summer heat. And I just want to note a true confession of any winter sower, like springs come, summers come, falls come, and you still have some pots hanging around the garden that you haven't planted. Well, natives are incredibly forgiving. I've had just pots that got stuck in a corner for a year or even more, and I go put them out in the garden and they do just great. That's just one of the beauties of native plants. There's a saying that probably some of you gardeners know about natives, that they don't burst forth and fill a flower bed in the first two or three months like zinnias or marigolds might. The first year they sleep, you know, they look kind of like this. They're just kind of, you know, a, a little mound, or the first season, I should actually say. And then they creep. The one you see in the middle um, was actually fall of the year that I planted them. So you can see, you know, a few flowers blooming there. But then the second or, uh, year or the third season of planting, they just explode and they leap and they'll totally fill up your flower beds. And that's the stage where the really beneficial stage when they're gonna stop those invasive weeds from coming up in your beds because they're gonna crowd them out. Now, you do need to occasionally separate them and, and replant them. And this is the same thing. You can give some to friends, you can, create new flower beds on your own property. And you'll never have to buy that variety of native plant again in a nursery because you're gonna have so many of them. Here's a few that Marlene and I have had good luck with blooming the first year. Like I said, generally, you're not gonna get this profusion of blooms um, the first year. So you need to cut your newly sown natives a little slack the first year. What they're really doing is developing that root system the first year, like we talked about. but. Some of our winter sown seedlings are real child prodigies, and these that you see up here all bloomed in the first year. Generally, these are um, natives that bloom in late summer or fall, so they've actually had you know a few months in in the in the ground. Um, but all of these are great to plant uh, your first year in the garden and, and to see them bloom. So I'm going to show you what a winter sown garden geared to birds and pollinators and beneficial insects looks like. This was a garden that I created uh, and this was August of 2021. This was from uh, native plants that I winter sowed the previous winter to this. This is it one year later. I mean it's just completely filled out. Now there are, you'll see up in the corner there, a few zinnias which obviously are not native but um, the goldfinches love them and my honeybees love them so I also always plant a little patch of them there. But the other things are the orange cone flowers, there's some goldenrod in which you can't see that bloomed earlier in this mass in the spring. There was a culver's root and different kinds of phlox. To buy all these plants in a nursery would have been a couple of hundred dollars and I did it all for free from seeds mostly that I collected from other places in my yard or in my neighbor's yard. And so this was my garden, and now Marlene's gonna show you what happened in her garden. Thanks, Molly. So Molly's garden showed you the beautiful summer interest of her variety of natives. <clears throat> I unfortunately didn't get good pictures of my gardens at the same time during the summer, but what I did realize I had was comparison of my gardens in October which is an interesting time because most of the blooms are gone, but there's still a lot of plant interest in the garden. This is what my native bed looked like that I prepared in October, of, that I planted in October of 21. I started this garden by doing some sheet mulching in the spring, and then I waited until the fall, and I planted a few shrubs that I had gotten from a native plant sale, and also a few plugs. But, you know, there's not much going on there. But then this year, after my winter sowing in the, the winter of 2022, I put in a lot of winter sown plants in the spring and summer this year. And this is what my garden looked like 
this fall. So it really does, native plants and winter sown plants do give you an opportunity to fill out a large space rather quickly. And I like to think that this shows how you do have a lot of fall interest even when the blooms are gone. And now that the blooms are gone, I'm concentrating on collecting like the winter interest photos. There's still a lot of um, basil leaf color in my um, gardens and there's a lot of stalks and seed heads that are providing a lot of interest and a lot of food for the birds. Thought that was a good comparison. So we've given you a lot of information today. We're here to help you go through your first steps of winter sowing some jugs with the seeds we have here to offer. We've listed the 10 steps here. There's also a handout that will be provided in your follow-up email that kind of demonstrates the process. The QR code on this slide, when you receive it, that'll take you to our initial, native, our initial winter sowing presentation that we did in the fall of 2020. We've got a lot of resources on the presentation for you when you get this. All the links should take you to the appropriate places. The University of Maryland has extensive resources on their website. And just so you know, the University of Maryland Master Gardeners, we're not just about native plants. We have multiple sub-programs that we talk about and promote.